This is a production of Cornell University. Good morning or good afternoon or good night, wherever you are. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, and I would like to thank the uh, Synapses student group for this really excellent organization and also Corteva for sponsoring this fantastic international series of uh, symposia. Um, when I was asked to give a title, I thought uh, this was several months ago when I said, uh, well, it all amounts to eat more beans. Uh, little did I know that um, uh, actually people do eat more beans, apparently, or at least they buy more beans in, in this time. Um, but um, it is, uh, in order to eat more beans, we have to produce more beans. And so there is a genetic uh, component to it. And uh, what I would like to illustrate today is how the knowledge of the phylogeny, but also of the differential uh, the environmental uh, origins of uh, common bean um, affect domestication and affect agronomic traits uh, that we can use uh, in breeding. So I would like to thank the members of my group. I, uh, I picked a picture of last year. Uh, today, this group is somewhat, uh, it shows up as little squares on a Zoom screen. Um, but but uh, they are hanging in there. And uh, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, I also would like to thank sources of funding, which have been USDA and IFA and various sources uh, in the uh, industry. Um, so, in line with the, the, the general theme of the symposia, bringing back biodiversity, uh, I will uh, discuss first, give you an overall introduction of what we know at this stage of common bean phylogeny or genealogy, and then uh, discuss three specific topics, um, a better understanding of the genetic diversity and uh, climatic distribution of the wild progenitor of common bean, and that is the work of Andrea Ariani, who was a postdoc in my lab and is now working in Ghent uh, with uh, Bayer. Um, and the second topic will be the, based on that first topic is, can we use the wild progenitor to derive uh, drought tolerance? And that is the work of Jorge Berni, um, who was a former student and postdoc uh, from Mexico and has just returned to his country. And the third topic is to look at pod in the hissens as a domestication trait, but also as it results is a aridity tolerance uh, trait. And that is the work of Travis Parker. And uh, Travis is very polyvalent. Uh, you see in my background here, uh, a series of varieties of heirloom varieties that he is releasing now that have uh, virus uh, resistance, and that's part of his uh, thesis as well. So, um, what do we know about the phylogeny of uh, Phaseolus vulgaris? And our view is being kind of influenced by the idea of gene pool, so similarities between different populations or lines. Um, initially, um, what you, we, we knew that the distribution of wild common bean here in the Americas is extremely large. The genus itself it originated in what is now called Mexico, and uh, that's where you find most of the species. But we also see that some species have ex expanded their range uh, into uh, South America also North America, as well as some of the islands that surround um, the Americas. And one of the questions is how did this come about? When did this come about? And what is the effect on the overall genetic diversity uh, of this, this uh, wild taxon, actually? 
So early on, we had determined that there was a, um, most of the diversity was actually uh, assessed in, in commonly through their domestication, uh, the domesticated varieties, but outside of the center of origin. There was very little study about the diversity of land races, for example, and also especially of the wild, uh, potential wild progenitor. So the uh, first result uh, was that the domesticated gene pool results actually from two separate domestications, one of them in the Southern Andes and the other one in uh, Mexico. A second important result was that the land races, both in the Mesoamerican gene pool and the Andean gene pool, could be subdivided into ecogeographic races. So they had a specific uh, geography, also ecology, and certainly also morphology, as well as some agronomic traits like disease resistances and so on. And so in the Mesoamerican gene pool, you had uh, three, first three, now four races. Um, and I draw your attention, I'll talk uh, more about that later on, uh, about the distinction between race Jalisco, which is a highland uh, race, and, uh, and uh, race Durango, which is also a highland race, but there is a distinction in terms of the amount of aridity that they are subject to. And race Durango is from northern Mexico, and so is subject to much more arid a climate um, versus the race Mesoamerica here, which is typically a lowland, more humid uh, race. And then race uh, Guatemala has recently been added, and um, I suspect that it's kind of a geographic variant of this race Jalisco from uh, central Mexico. In the Andean gene pool, among the land races, you see three races. The most common one, the one that we know the best, is Nueva Granada. That um, um, uh, has many of the bush determinate beans. But you also have race Chile, which is not well known, and then race Peru, which comes from the central part of the, uh, the Andes. In turn, these some of these races have been dispersed outside their centers of domestication, uh, especially race Mesoamerica and race Durango. Uh, race Jalisco and Guatemala have been left behind. The same thing here is race Nueva Granada and maybe to a certain extent race Chile have been disseminated to the rest of the world, but race Peru has been left behind. So these races that have been left behind, it's because of their photoperiod sensitivity and interactions with temperature. And so many times when you see a GWAS analysis, uh, it's based on materials here, uh, domesticated uh, varieties outside the centers of origin. And there are uh, significant uh, misses uh, in these uh, GWAS panels, as well as in the, um, as in the, uh, germplasm collections. For example, the USDA germplasm collection has a deficiency in these race Peru, race Jalisco, and so on. A third finding was that uh, if you look here at the map again, you see the red group that is a Mesoamerican group, the blue group is the Southern Andean group, and then you have this uh, yellow group, which is uh, initially was a gap, an artificial gap in the collection, but turns out to have fairly unique characteristics, including the existence of ancestral sequences of the major seed protein. So that uh, was uh, added uh, just uh, at the late 80s, late uh, early 90s. Although common bean is reputed to be a mostly selfing species, we see evidence that there is outcrossing between wild and domesticated types, uh, such that um, the diversity of the wild type is actually diminished because of gene flow from the uh, domesticated types into the wild populations that are sympatric with these uh, domesticated populations in, uh, in Mexico. 
uh, and uh, also we see the same phenomena in the endings. And either a legacy or more recently, breeders have attempted or and can actually intergress the two major gene pools that have been domesticated. Uh, in breeding, for example, it's to introduce mostly Mesoamerican alleles for disease resistance into the Andes. Overall, you see a much more reduced genetic diversity in the Andean gene pool compared to the Mesoamerican gene pool. Uh, now, the Andean gene pool, although it has less diversity, it has qualitatively, it has different alleles or different genes uh, that have been selected. So they uh, form a valuable component of a gene bank. And so uh, I'll look at three topics in this uh, genealogy. The first one is to better understand what the relationship is between these wild gene pools in Me Mesoamerica, in the Andes, as well as here, this group of Ecuador and Northern Peru. I will then also look at how maybe we can re-domesticate uh, wild beans by incorporating uh, genes for drought tolerance uh, into the domesticated gene pool. And in the third place, I look at the genetics of shattering, part shattering, uh, which appears to be a, a, a characteristic of this raised Durango uh, so far. So the reason I think the motivation to, to look at these wild beans is to try to understand this wide distribution from northern Mexico to northwest Argentina. And this is a more or less continuous uh, distribution of 10,000 kilometers, but there are some gaps, uh, which we now know are real gaps and not just gaps in the collection, and they correspond to lower lying areas which are hot and humid. Uh, so wild beans prefer these kind of moderate temperatures, moderate uh, rainfall. Uh, but the question is, how did we get to such a distribution and when did this happen? Actually, So you see here, this photo is a population, a photo taken in December at the end of the cycle. All green matters are shrubs uh, unrelated to wild beans and you see the uh, the massive pod load here uh, of uh, these wild beans at the end of their cycle. Uh, I've taken here photos all along this distribution of wild beans and the, it's an environment that is heavily impacted by humans, which is an argument for ex situ uh, uh, conservation, at least in part. Uh, but what it also showed, the map here, is that there is differentiation of these wild populations all along. The, uh, the distribution, you have primarily here a group in Mexico, um, but then also a group that represents a range expansion into Central America and Colombia. And then you have these two Andean groups from Ecuador and Northern Peru here, and then from the Southern Andes, okay? So there is, we knew that there was geographic differentiation. So the idea now is to conduct genotyping by sequencing uh, on a collection of about 250, 300 uh, wild populations that are representative of the entire distribution. And what Andrea did was an in silico uh, analysis uh, based on the, uh, genome reference sequence with different enzymes and to see identified enzyme that would really have a broad distribution across the genome. Uh, and so what you see on the right here is a comparison of this CVIA2 enzyme he identified compared to with the, the more traditionally used APEK1. And you see that a, a larger number of total sites, this is the recognition uh, sequence of this site is only four bases and it's not methylation sensitive. The genome of beans is much smaller than, for example, maize. It's about 600 million. So we could afford to have, uh, to use a, a, an enzyme that was, um, had a more 
um, recognition sites. And you see also that the effect of using CBIA2 is that you tag a larger number of gene models in the bean genome. Uh, and it's thought that the approximately 97% of the gene models were tagged compared to about 60% for APEK1. So did this uh, way of approaching, uh, did it uh, first confirm what we knew already or and it turns out that is that that is the case. You see again the distribution here of wild beans. There is a large group here which represents the original area of distribution, um, and then a dissemination, a two dissemination and long distance dissemination events. The yellow one here, and then the blue one, but which have much less diversity. Now, this configuration of the SNP diversity in the wild beans matches that uh, of the, um, the SNP configuration in domesticated types. And you see here the, Mex uh, me uh, the Mesoamerican domesticated gene pool. And on the right side, this very tight cluster of Andean domesticates. And consistent with the reduction in diversity you see following this dispersal from Mesoamerica into the Andes. And then along the second axis, you see a separation of the highland races, uh, especially the race Durango, and here the lowland race, race Mesoamerica. Now, the, the reason, I think, for the, uh, um, the reduction in diversity you see here in the Andean group uh, it's several fold. Uh, first one is that we see a very strong correlation between the uh, latitude and the principal component scores. Um, and this correlation breaks down uh, around 15 degree northern latitude, which corresponds to this line here. And so from this, this latitude on down, you have a very narrow distribution, uh, which uh, accounts for part of this reduction in diversity. The second reason is that probably these dissemination events are fairly rare. And there was a, a modeling studies done separately by European scientists a few years ago, uh, documenting that um, if you see uh, a rare a rare event of long distance dispersal, you tend to generate what they called an embolism effect, where one or a limited number of haplotypes take over the distribution at a distance. And you see here the number of generations, and then the, the, the starting point of the dispersal event is at the bottom. And you see as with time, you go and you see this, uh, embolism effect of reducing genetic diversity. The other argument is that really the, the habitat that is suitable for these wild beans is extremely narrow. If you look at the Andes, for example, in Ecuador, we found these wild beans, the triangles here, only in one particular vegetation type, a type of uh, forest on the western side of the Andes here in Ecuador and, and Colombia and, and Peru as well, actually. Further to the south, uh, in a different collection, we found the um, wild beans at the transition between two vegetation types, but still a very narrow uh, habitat, uh, uh, which uh, probably helped uh, or also led to this uh, embolism effect. Um, we see. Now you can look at the diversity here, and that's where it, uh, this genomic approach became useful in that we see whether we look at genic variants or non-genic variants, it's the same. You have the tree here has a root in the group from Ecuador and Northern Peru. And the distinction between Andean and Mesoamerican types only comes afterwards, after this first uh, migration to Ecuador. You have a second migration to 
um, to the southern Andes, but it comes afterward. The first separation is really this small group in Ecuador and northern Peru. As I told you, this small group has some ancestral sequences and which are not found, even though they are ancestral, in the area of origin in Mesoamerica. And so we have somewhat of a paradox where ancestral sequences have become extinct in the area of origin, but survive till today in a derived, uh, uh, derived area. When did these events happen? You can date them, and there are several groups that have dated them, and they come with more or less consistent results. So the first long-term dispersal was around uh, 500,000 years ago, uh, and the second dispersal um, was, took place about 100,000 years ago. And then this was followed by two domestications, one in the Southern Andes uh, and one in Mesoamerica, about five to 10,000 years ago. So documented that we have these long distance dispersal. We have, we know approximately when they happen, how did they happen and what were the vectors uh, really um, uh, that caused, that allowed this dispersal to take place. And um, you see here the potential is migratory birds. You have to account for a vector that is able to bridge these large depression areas, uh, like the Isthmus of Panama, the Isthmus of um, the Huantepec, uh, also the Chocó region in, 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 in Colombia. And, and one observation is that we did in Ecuador was that, the, uh, that we saw bird damage, actually. The birds tend to want to eat the seeds. They nibble at the tip, towards the tip of the pod. The pod opens and presumably they then eat the, the seed. And I remind you that these are wild seeds, so they're much smaller, about a tenth smaller than the smallest domesticated uh, seeds. And the local name for wild beans is actually frijol de paloma, or dove or pigeon bean, actually. That raises the question, are there uh, pigeons that have such a distribution, uh, that have a migration, and we see several examples uh, of this uh, here. Um, and so uh, it suggests that, um, that the, this long, long distance dispersal may have taken place through birds, uh, but it raises a series of, of questions uh, also, and I won't get into that. Okay, so we can now add some more details uh, to this uh, phylogeny that uh, the yellow here gene pool of Ecuador and northern Peru has since been renamed as a separate species uh, based on the ecology, its uh, age, and also the metabolomic results obtained by Mexican scientists, which show that this wild type is more closely related to Phaseolus coccineus than to Phaseolus vulgaris. And also, we can add the dates for this separation. Now, as I said, these are two domestications in Mesoamerica and, and the Andes. Um, they are well documented, and it seemed to be that there is an incipient speciation because you have, in 10 or 15 percent of the crosses, you see uh, reproductive isolation uh, as F1 inviability or F1 uh, stability. Okay. One of the questions then is, among these two major groups, the two gene pools of wild uh, beans, can we um, identify sources of drought tolerance? And the idea was that, well, wild beans have been subjected to these various climatic cycles and they have survived it, certainly for at least 500,000 years. Um, as it turns out, if you look at the distribution of climatic conditions among, um, among these wild beans, and again, you see here the distribution of wild beans in the Americas, we see uh, four groups, uh, or three groups, actually. One of them is 
present at the extremes of the distribution and is characterized by a long dry season of at least six months. Towards the equator, however, you have also wild beans and there the, the season is much shorter, but it's still there. And the thinking is that these even short seasons are necessary for pouts to shatter, okay? And hence the, the, the third topic I, I will be addressing is that pod shattering. But the question is, so hi hypothesis, are these beans from the, especially the dry areas, are they good sources of vari variation for drought tolerance? So this is the work of uh, Jorge Berni, as I told you, he's a former graduate student, uh, very productive, uh, also postdoc, and he has now returned to Yucatan, uh, his native Yucatan in Mexico. So again, this is the study that uh, Andrea Ariani had conducted. You see there is a structure analysis where the accessions are listed here according to their uh, latitude. And so you see three Mesoamerican groups, um, the orange, the ye yellow, and the blue one here. You see this intermediate group um, from Ecuador and Northern Peru and you have the Southern Andes group. If we look, compare these, their data of origin with climatic data for these locations, what we see is that the driest areas are indeed at the extremities. You see um, wild MW1 group here in Northern Mexico, the Andean wild group in, in Argentina primarily, uh, they are the driest, um, ah, I'm sorry. On the other hand, you look at the temperature, the hottest uh, is here around the equator, but combined with the driest uh, group here, it seems like a candidate for, uh, candidate region for drought tolerance ought to be in Northern Mexico. So Jorge was faced with a difficulty, however, that it's very difficult to assess or to evaluate wild populations on their own. And there's a number of reasons for that. You see, first of all, the growth habit, uh, the natural environment, um, and uh, so these are climbing viney types, uh, difficult to, to, to manage. Um, they also shatter, uh, so it's difficult to measure yield. Uh, they are photoperiod sensitive. Uh, and also they have, they have differences in their seeds, the, the, the number of seeds and, and the size of the, the seeds. So a, a way around this is not easy, but uh, what he did, was then to do a, a test cross or nested uh, populations where he took three wild populations uh, along a gradient of precipitation. And uh, so you have here, a, a, in a sense, a humid control uh, from Guatemala with a rainfall of 2000 millimeters. You have an intermediate case here about 800 millimeters and then in uh, a population in the north of Mexico, about 500 millimeters. These three populations were crossed to the same domesticated line as a tester, and the domesticated line had been previously also bred for drought tolerance. So the idea was to see, can we obtain even higher drought tolerance in, in the domesticated gene pool? Uh, there were uh, three environments in 2014 and 2015, well watered. And then in 2015, uh, we compared the well watered versus the terminal drought. So this is what the, the kind of one of the bean fields looked like. And you can see there is a square here of green plants. And these are the progenies of these crosses with wild beans. They tend to be later, uh, even if we select against um, against the late flowering type that result from photoperiod sensitivity, 
um, so Jorge is selected against these, and you see a clearly bimodal population uh, indicating that there is a single major gene, and we know that this is the PPD gene, which uh, also has recently been identified by Jim Weller in Australia and Marta Santaya in, in Spain. This is what the seeds look like. You have C5 crossed to one of the wild populations. You have an F1 here. It's one back cross and then four generations of selfing, and that's the, the diversity you see here. So the results are that uh, this was the average yield of C5, the domesticated parent, and that is really the control. Uh, among the, the rills, uh, you could, you, you saw a variation. Uh, what was hopeful, uh, even though the mean was below the, the domesticated type, you had some rills that were above the, the, the yield of the domesticated parents. The, factors, uh, population environment and population by environment, all significant. Uh, the population means, and I've color coded them for the red, this is the driest one from the north, uh, dry population here from the central area, and then the wet population from uh, Guatemala here is in green. And you see that the highest actually, the two highest yielding populations are really from the drier area, and not from the wet area. There were also clear differences between the three environments, and 2014 was a bad year, uh, lots of insects and so on, uh, but situation got better in uh, 2015. Now this graph shows the three, the three environment, the, the, the three populations in the three environments. You have a well watered in 2014, well watered in 2015, and a terminal drought. You see here the, the yield of C5, the domesticated uh, control. And on the averages are of these three descendant populations are not higher than C5 per se. But what was hopeful was that there were individual lines that were way above the domesticated parent. Okay, so that was uh, hopeful. Um, we conducted a uh, the population was genotyped with a SNP, uh, low density uh, SNP, and you see a number of QTLs appearing. They tend to be grouped, and some of them are really grouped at the end of uh, chromosomes, uh, which is consistent with what we know about gene distribution in general. So the number of QTLs, there were nine in one of the two well water treatments in, under drought, there were five QTLs for yield. Uh, and the mean across the three treatments, but there were also five uh, QTLs. Um, the effect of these QTLs was, as predicted, small from one to 5%. Um, the additive effect, and that is the more interesting aspect, is that the largest positive effect came from this population um, in the intermediate population in the well watered condition in 2015. The smallest, or the, this is a negative effect, came from the population from Guatemala, which originated in a rainy type of um, uh, environment in well watered conditions. So the overall, it looks, like the green, the, the, the well watered population, the, the population from the rainy area in Guatemala did not have a positive effect. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Ah. When we calculated the averages of these additive effects, however, in the well watered condition, the, the three population didn't really contribute to yield overall, although the effect was fairly small if you compare to the, the yield of uh, C5, the domesticated uh, parent. It was slightly negative. However, if when we look at the effects under drought, the 
populations from the dry area had a strong positive effect, a strong additive effect. Uh, and again, the population from Guatemala, from the moist area, did not really contribute to yield. So our reasoning is the, here, our conclusion temp, uh, so far is that these populations from the drier areas are extremely valuable uh, for drought tolerance. Uh, they don't affect the well watered uh, conditions, but they help the domesticated types under drought conditions. Um, an additional evidence for that is that uh, you can identify, and these are five lines that on the average over the three environments, both well watered and dry environments, yield significantly more than the domesticated control. And that varies uh, in most of the cases in a, in a favorable environment, whether it's well watered or drought stress, they were above the domesticated control. Okay, so it was a positive. Um, there was a separate experiment. I don't have time to talk about it. Um, with these lines, these wild populations were grown in a greenhouse experiment. And it turns out that the wild populations from drier areas have deeper, relatively deeper rooting system and are also able to reshape their rooting system under drought stress more efficiently uh, for the same amount of biomass. Also, wild beans have a tendency of, even in the presence of drought, of continuing their growth, whereas domesticated type uh, stop their growth uh, for as long as the, the drought conditions uh, persist. So it was, a, in a sense, there is a consistent body of data uh, that uh, if you're looking at wild beans for, the, for drought tolerance, uh, clearly you have the, um, you have the choice of wild populations, and we can uh, use GIS to identify such a population. The choice of the testing environment, you definitely have to use uh, drought, that seems obvious. Uh, but even under well watered conditions, the yield overall will not be affected. Um, the choice of traits, I've mentioned that these wild beans have deeper roots and continue their growth. And the choice of the breeding method, we used one backcross, and that was a choice, a deliberate choice, because we wanted to introduce as much as possible um, diversity from the wild uh, types. Okay. And so what is left to do is to integrate these, wild, uh, these uh, progeny lines, the, the best progeny lines, into a regular breeding program. How am I doing on time here? Ah, okay, thanks. I, um, so I, just a, 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 the last item, and it's related to this, uh, um, the, you'll see the, the drought tolerance, is that pod indehiscence is a domestication trait because uh, that is widely recognized. Now, the fact is that pod dehiscence has survived in the domesticated gene pool. This is the work of Travis Parker, who is also the author of the, uh, these new, uh, newly released uh, varieties. And as part of his thesis, he also looked at the, the um, part uh, in the dehiscence genetics. So you see here, again, a population uh, of wild uh, beans. You see the plants here, they carry the pods. They don't immediately release these seeds, even though they are really, they have reached maturity. And so that's why you need this period of dry, uh, uh, dry period to allow the pods to, uh, to, to free up their seed through the hissens. When you have the hissens, you have this characteristic kind of compass feature here where the two valves of the pod separate and also twist. And the twisting actually conveys a, um, a slingshot movement to the, to the seeds, which spread the seeds around the, the, the plant. 
Uh, and you see this here, this is pods of wild beans, so sharply uh, twisted uh, valves. This is a dry bean, uh, where there is still some twisting, but much less. And then this is a, a green bean or snap bean at the right here, where the pod does not open at all. There are different genetic systems for the green bean and the dry bean domesticated types. The system of the green bean um, is epistatic onto the dry bean pod dehiscent system. Uh, I won't talk about that in this talk, but I will talk about the, the genetics of this uh, pod in dehiscence. And you see here two varieties of the breeding program. You see this variety was developed by Steve Temple uh, because the, uh, this, this variety showed heavy, um, heavy uh, pod shattering. And it is a surprise, is it, why is this trait that is deleterious still survive in the domesticated chimpanzee? So you see that also in the different market classes here, uh, and especially uh, prone to shattering are the cranberries, somewhat also the, the, the kidneys, uh, in the Andean gene pool, and then in the Mesoamerican gene pool, you have the small blacks and the navies, okay? So Travis used uh, three uh, methods. Uh, uh, one is the evaluation in the field, shattering, no shattering, uh, simple. Uh, then an oven method where you put the, temp the pods, a sample of the pods at uh, 65 degrees for a week. You let them equilibrate after that and you count the number of pods that shattered. And then a force method that in, imposes a force and measures the force that is needed to shatter the pod. So the result of that is that if you do a QTL analysis in a population, it is a Mesoamerican population, the three methods actually give you the same result with a major QTL on chromosome three. What is different, however, is that the method, the more precise the method, the higher the lot score and the fraction of the, of the phenotype, phenotypic variation represented, okay? And so you have some lot scores of 50, actually, I think. Wouldn't we all like to have a lot score of 50, actually? So, um, so then the, the peak here actually includes a homolog of uh, the PDH, um, it's pod dehiscence that had been identified in soybean as well. And is, uh, the, there is a candidate gene for that and it's called the dirigent gene, which uh, helps assemble the lignin polymer from its individual monomers, okay? Travis then also looked at the uh, GWAS type of analysis with two panels that had been developed uh, in beans, one for the Mesoamerican domestication and the other for the Andean undomesticated bean. He confirmed that location on chromosome three. And there was also one uh, potentially here on uh, chromosome eight. In the Andean group, there is apparently the same, the same peak, but it is, when you look at the detail of the data, it's on chromosome three also, but it's not quite the same peak. So it may be a different, um, a different gene involved on chromosome three. And he confirmed what other researchers have found, a, a separate peak on chromosome five. So on the face of it, actually, the two domestications have achieved the same result, uh, uh, reduction in, in pod dehiscence, but through uh, sometimes different genes. Uh, one of the things that you can do is um, do a principal component analysis of these um, uh, panels. Uh, and the, in the Mesoamerican panel, the, the principal component, the first principal component separates Reyes Durango, which is highland and dry, and Reyes Mesoamerica, which is lowland and more humid. What you see is that the group that is classified as Reyes Durango, in its majority, has the mutation 
that is correlated with um, the, uh, power, the resistance to shattering. And so you see very low levels of shattering in this race Durango. And this is a race that is represented in the US with the Pintos, the Great Northerns, for example. On the other hand, in race Mesoamerica, you have a much greater variation in the amount of dehiscence. There is a mutation among a few of the lines, and this is the, the, um, the QTL we had identified on chromosome eight, okay? So different lineages have different reaction to pod dehiscence and different mutations leading to QTLs of, uh, of controlling pod in dehiscence. Uh, this is a fantastic table, but it's obviously you can't read this, uh, but it, it shows the, the, the genes or QTLs that have been identified related to pod in dehiscence, both in green beans and dry beans, and pretty much a large majority of the chromosomes are involved in this. So we can answer the question asked at the beginning is to say, why is it that some uh, market classes still have this dehiscence? Um, and uh, I suggest here that you have multiple genes involved. Each of them reduces dehiscence. However, when you cross these lines with separate de in the, uh, dehiscence genes, you restore, you, you complement actually these genes. Your F1 will start shattering, but whether or not you'll see it depends on the environmental condition under which you, condition, you, con you conduct your breeding program. Under dry areas, uh, under wet areas, you will not see the shattering. And so you can perpetuate through these crosses, uh, you can perpetuate the issue of uh, pod dehiscence. And in California, where it's very dry in the summer, we immediately notice uh, when there is uh, pod uh, dehiscence, okay? So, um, again, and also the, 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 this, having this phylo phylogeny and the, the adaptation of the different gene pools and being able to place the different mutations on this helps us understand the genetic variation uh, present uh, in this species. Am I out of time? So you yes. are gonna have about 10 minutes for questions after here. Oh, let me quickly. So I think domestication is often seen as the beginning of agriculture. I consider it to be the apotheosis of hunter-gatherers. Uh, it's important to understand plant and crop function. And wild and domesticated types have uh, very different uh, selective regimes in terms of plant type, uh, pod, uh, seed dispersal, and so on. It is possible to identify groups of wild beans associated with different environmental conditions. Um, in terms of drought tolerance, we need to define the taxa populations, the genes, and the traits, actually, uh, that are valid or can be pursued. Um, wild beans from the driest areas are very useful in terms of drought tolerance. It's certainly something to pursue. Um, and um, the comparative approaches are very useful. And I think that here we have, have talked about common bean, but let me remind you that there are four other domesticated species. There is lima bean, which also has a double domestication. And then you have runner bean, tepary bean, and year bean. And these show a different gradation in domestication. So I think that we are going to turn towards more comparative uh, studies here. So thanks very much uh, for your attention. Awesome, thank you. That was a wonderful talk and also really highlighting the importance of crop wild relatives and some of the diversity that can be found in them. Um, it looks like we already have one question ready to go, but if anyone else has questions, please feel free to either raise your hand through the Zoom function or type in your question via chat. So it looks like Joyce Cherry, uh, if you would like to unmute yourself. 
Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much for the talk. I recently started working with Phaseolus vulgaris, um, thinking about the vining habit uh, that's found in some of the uh, races. And I've been curious now from your talk if there is any relationship with um, plant habit and, uh, and yield. Yes, there is absolutely a relationship. Viney types yield about two to three times more than bush types. And so, if, I, if you'll allow me, um, and so why you say, why, why do people plant bush types? But it's for economic reasons is that they require, uh, viney types require more labor, okay? Now there are conditions where there is labor available. So if you go to Rwanda, for example, the Rwandan government has policies in place to stimulate production of beans because it's an essential source of proteins in the diet of people of Rwanda and the surrounding countries. And so um, in, originally in the country, I think uh, viney types were about 10% of bean production. Now they are above 50%. And so this is a conscious move to rely on these viney types to increase uh, bean production by, by the, the Rwandan government. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. I have a follow-up. Is, is that because um, the vining types pr produce more uh, leaf biomass or is it because they more uh, accessibly access light? Do, do we know why they're able no. to produce more yield? Well, the immediate relationship is the number of nodes, because at every node you have a leaf, but also you have an inflorescence with flowers and then pods. And so the number of nodes is much bigger um, in a viney type than in a bush type, actually. Okay. And there are different viney types, actually. There is a whole range in terms of uh, climbing, aggressiveness, and so on. Actually. So you have to be careful about which genotype you pick. Actually. And in, in Rwanda, for example, they, it's a monoculture of beans. They are, don't grow corn and beans. So they have to have, so they use kind of sticks uh, as a support. And, and uh, in the breeding process, you have to be careful not to breed for beans, climbing beans that are too vigorous because they're going to topple the, the, the sticks, actually. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Okay, it looks like we have another question from Hannah Jeffrey, if you could unmute yourself. Hi there. Hi. I am a, doc a student of Dr. Karen Sehe, USDA ARS Dry Bean Breeding and Genetics Program. Yes. And I'm currently conducting research on uh, beans as uh, in relation to their cooking time. So I was just wondering, um, for, um, I was just wondering if you, what your opinions were about uh, fluttering and flooding tolerance. Have you seen any of that in your research or are you not looking for that right now? Because flooding tolerance is also an important consideration in um, Michigan, I believe, as we get more, um, just more rainfall in general than you would expect in perhaps Mexico for some of these varieties. Yeah, we have not addressed, and I know it's probably Michigan also in North Dakota. North Dakota especially, yes. Yeah, the Red River Valley. Uh, so, uh, but in California, we have a hard time uh, justifying research on flooding. Um, um, we are principally preoccupied with um, with drought conditions. Actually, um, now I could ask, I could answer also. Where would we go? Would wild beans be a good source of flooding tolerance? Well, maybe some of these beans from on the opposite end of the gradient I show you in Guatemala, where they have two thousand millimeters of rainfall uh, mm. they might be a better choice and you, you would make the opposite calculation actually okay 
Okay. But I'm not sure. I, I, I don't have experience with that trait, actually. Okay. Uh, it's uh, very nice to meet you, sir. Thank you for your question. No problem. Oh, by the way, was MYB86 brought up by another presenter earlier? That is possible, but I've not been able to follow uh, all of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was a, it was about uh, the dehis. It was about a uh, grass uh, abscission layer. Abscission. That was abscission a zones. Kellogg's talk. Yes. It, it, it's it's. Uh... Anyway, I just thought it was interesting. Okay. Well, it looks like we have another question. Uh, Shtea, would you like to ask your question? Sure. Thanks for the great talk, Dr. Paul. My question is, is there a linkage drug in using the wild relatives as a source of drug tolerance? And if so, how to deal with that? Thank you. Yeah, I think that that's a good question. And, you know, I, I say we have superior lines, but we have yet, and they have uh, the same days to flowering. Uh, they are slightly smaller seeds than the domesticated control. So the next step is to really transfer the drought tolerance into commercial classes. And I think that this is an issue of, uh, in part, linkage drag or linkage disequilibrium. Will we be able to recover the seeds with the colors that we need to fit into a commercial class. Uh, these color genes are distributed on also on many, many uh, chromosomes. And it, I consider this to be almost like a fixed part of the genome. We have to achieve, we have to get those. And will we have enough recombination between this set of color genes, for example, and growth habit genes and the set of QTLs that we identified as conferring drought tolerance. Um, overall, there is less linkage drag in the, in the wild types compared to the domesticated types. But here we are in a domesticated type and we have used one backcross and four, uh, four cell or cell thing generations. So they will not break up really the, the linkages. And I think that that is one of the major problems in uh, common bean breeding because there is so much importance on the appearance of the, uh, the, the seeds and that these genes are distributed all over the genome. So I, th I think it's a good question, but we don't know uh, at this stage, okay? I think it's a problem whether you use wild beans or domesticated beans as a source of diversity. Mm -hmm. Awesome, well, we are out of time now, um, but if people have more questions for Paul, uh, he will be having a breakout session during our next coffee break at 3.45, so. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web, at cornell.edu.